Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done over 500 of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu, where you'll see all the previous ones archived in several different ways. And also, while you're there, check around the other menus on the site, you'll find some useful things. Um, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to support it in any amount, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. Since about 1970, I've been aware that there's significant evidence that extraterrestrial and non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. At least this, that's been my feeling. Um, I've even had a couple of experiences myself. It hasn't been a central focus for me, um, but I've always found it interesting and have felt that this interaction is somehow involved in the global spiritual awakening which seems to be taking place. I've wanted to cover this topic on BatGap, but most of the people who talk about it are psychics and channelers or are primarily interested in the debate over whether we're being visited, um, or they focus on conspiracy theories about government cover-ups and things like that. And I, I didn't want to get into all that. Um, so I asked my friend Alex Sikaris of Skeptico.com, who he would recommend that I interview on this topic that could be, you know, kind of scientific and objective about it. Um, and he recommended today's guest, um, Ray Hernandez. Um, so here he is. Welcome, Ray. Thank you very much, Rick. Yeah, I'll read your bio here. Um, Ray graduated with honors from Rutgers College, uh, was a master's candidate <clears throat> at Cornell University, and was a PhD candidate at the University of California at Berkeley, where he was the recipient of a National Science Foundation PhD fellowship. He previously was a professor for six years at the New School for Social Research and at the City University of New York, and he is currently an attorney with the U.S. Department of Treasury in Miami, Florida. Ray is the executive director of the Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, CCRI, a nonprofit academic research institute comprised of 15 PhD academics and medical doctors whose mission it is to explore the relationship between consciousness, cosmology, and contact with non-human intelligence. Ray was previously one of the co-founders of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, a nonprofit academic research institute comprised of 12 PhD academics and lay researchers who recently completed a five-year comprehensive worldwide academic research study on UFO contact experiencers. The late Apollo 14 astronaut, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth, the sixth man to walk on the moon and the founder of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and Dr. Rudy Shield, Emeritus Professor of Astrophysics at Harvard University, were two of that organization's co-founders. The study I just referred to um, resulted in the creation of an 820-page book entitled Beyond UFOs, The Science of Consciousness and Contact with Non-Human Intelligence, Volume 1. Ray is one of its three co-authors. He has also published in several peer-reviewed academic journals, including the Journal of Consciousness Studies and the Journal of the Society for Scientific Exploration. Ray's new projects are a three-volume book and a full feature science documentary titled A Greater Reality, The New Paradigm of Consciousness, The Paranormal, and the, Con and the Contact Modalities. And the reason I chuckled a little bit while I was reading that is I am aware that Ray works a full-time job as an attorney, and somehow um, I suppose has been given superpowers by the aliens because he manages <laughs> to accomplish all this stuff on top of his full-time job. So how do you do that, Ray? <laughs> well, I have a workload review on September the 23rd, and basically I'm going to shut down all of my extracurricular activities and just focusing on preparing for that workload review. But no, it's been very difficult, very strenuous. I, I don't sleep much. Um, this is my full-time um, hobby. Uh, we're not paid for this. <laughs> we're all volunteers. And you're dealing with very high-level academics at the highest level of, of academia um, to try to do this work. So it's, it's been extremely difficult. Yeah, well, I hope you keep an eye on your health, you know, and don't 
overdo it too well, much. Well, I've gained 40 pounds <laughs> uh. since my initial experience in 2012. So um, I, I'm not taking care of my health. <laughs> I want to ask you about your initial experience in just a second since you just alluded to it. Um, but first, let me ask you, um, how did Edgar Mitchell get interested in all this? Did he have some kind of contact experience as an astronaut? Yes. Um, Edgar Mitchell, even before he went on to the moon, um, he conducted um, um, a, um, a probability experiment, a consciousness probability experiment out in space um, where he brought a deck of... Um, of um, of uh, cards that um, that J. B. Ryan out of the Princeton uh, peer-reviewed lab used to u- used to uh, engage, you know, the psi phenomenon and and ESP, and so he brought that card uh, out, and he uh, also left um, um, out in space notations for five different people here on Earth. They didn't even know each other. So what he did is he told people at this particular time, this particular hour. I'm going to pull out my cards and I'm going to note them down of what came out. And then he's going to be projecting in his mind after he pulled out each card. So he projected his thoughts out to the universe of what was shown. And I forgot exactly how many cards they were. But then he compared it when, he's, when he returned back to Earth. And it was shown that uh, it was statistically significant that ESP uh, occurred. Um, coming back from the moon, <laughs> not just on Earth, but even at a great distances. So he was always interested in these things. And then um, uh, he had a, 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 a samadhi experience in space that many of the mystical meditators have, near-death experiences have, and also people that have had um, very uh, direct UFO contact with non-human intelligence have. And that is where, um, for uh, an instant, you're shown universal knowledge, but then um, almost immediately it gets taken away. And for him, it was that we're all interconnected, that there's no separation, even the smallest molecule uh, in the universe, I'm connected to that, that smallest atom and molecule. And there was a very, very profound experience for him. And then upon when he returned, he wanted to find out what well, what the hell was that? You know, what was that about? And then uh, he began to do research, and it was a professor of um, of religion that told him what you had was a samadhi experience. And many of the yogis and folks in the uh, Indian mystical tradition uh, have had that. And um, and and then he immediately, within a year later, started the Institute for Noetic Sciences uh, in 1972, which is now known as the world's um, leading academic uh, research institute on uh, on the psi phenomena. Yeah, good. Yeah, I've had Dean Radin on the show. He's the yep. chief, chief scientist there, and I'll be having Cassandra Vietan soon. She's also the, one of the heads of that organization. Um, and so how about you? You were just a sort of an ordinary guy. Uh, you, I've heard you describe yourself as having been a materialist, atheist, nihilist kind of guy. And all of a sudden, you had this amazing experience, which changed your life. Let's Let's hear about that. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be uh, as brief as I can. Um, before March uh, 4th of 2012, um, I was an overeducated uh, materialist rationalist, <laughs> um, an atheist. And, um, and then uh, I had an experience uh, that night, Saturday night, where our dog became, um, the day before, I think it was uh, um, Saturday, I don't know if it was the 3rd or the 4th, where yeah, where our dog uh, became totally paralyzed, our 15-year-old dog, who previously uh, to her paralysis was um, uh, had severe arthritis. She couldn't run. She couldn't jump. Um, we were keeping her alive with uh, with heavy medications. She was taking Viagra for her heart, et cetera. So, um, and then she became totally paralyzed. So, uh, I called our vet. And um, he said, from what you're telling me, Ray, it seems like she had a stroke, a cerebral hemorrhage, and I'll open up my office tomorrow to put her to sleep. And so my wife had just come from a three-day retreat at her church, which is a a pray retreat. All they did for three straight days is just pray, pray, pray. (laughs) So she came home, and she was fully energized from praying. And and once I told her, she became very depressed, but then immediately uh, began to pray. 
Uh, she uh, was raised in Mexico, raised in the Catholic faith, uh, having to go to church every Sunday, and then um, once a week for the uh, the uh, um, uh, to a, a ministry where they basically pray most of the time. So uh, she was used to this. So to me, it was like, do all the praying you want. Tomorrow she's going to go to sleep, you know, deal with it, you know. <laughs> and then the very next day at 6 in the morning, uh, the dog woke us up because the only thing she could do was bark. So we checked her out, and uh, she was still totally paralyzed. So I went back to bed. My wife carried her down the stairs because it's a small uh, Jack Russell Terrier, weighed uh, 20 pounds or less. <clears throat> so she carried her down the stairs, and there, uh, um, my this is my wife is telling me this information afterwards, appeared to her um, a small object. It looks like an upside-down U. Um, uh, sort of metallic in in uh, um, was the structure of it, uh, about a um, a foot wide, a foot and a half in height, um, and but it was phasing in and out of reality. And then she saw that she immediately said, "My angels came," and she began to pray. And then um, this green light shot out and began like to scan her. And um, she was calling me not because she was scared, but she wanted me to see her angel because she was totally convinced that this was angelic. And so this was Sunday morning at six o'clock and I was ignoring her and I was like, what the hell is she bothering me for, you know? <laughs> and so uh, she eventually went upstairs, she hauled me out of bed. Um, I gotta see this, I gotta see this. What is it, what is it? She wouldn't tell me. So then we both went down the stairs and then for, um, for your listeners, uh, brace yourself because what I'm gonna tell you is, uh, is um, uh, uh, my first of many experiences of high strangeness. Um, uh, she was then uh, stepped into the living room, and I was like on the bottom rung of the of of our st of our stair uh, steps, and uh, she disappeared right in front of me and poof, the dog. Just poof. Huh? And then uh, I had this is immediately this is back to back. Um, I had um, I could I could not see my peripheral vision. I could only see like a tunnel. If you put your hand right in front of you and you look, all around you is all dark. And uh, the only thing you could see is what is in that, that tunnel. And that was at the corner of our living room. And there I saw what I now describe as an energy being. And I'll describe it for you and your listeners. It was roughly two and a half feet wide uh, by a foot in height. Uh, it was shaped sort of like a rectangle, but it didn't have any hard edges because of pure energy. It had multiple colors, um, similar, I guess, if you had like these um, these uh, colors that you squeeze from a, a painter's tube into a bathtub, and you're squeezing many, many different colors, and then you get a stick and you're waving it, and it was doing that type of a, of a wave, like a mirage uh, type of waving, uh, semi-transparent. And, uh, and then this object immediately um, got into my consciousness. Um, I didn't care that my wife had disappeared, the dog had disappeared. I didn't care that I was watching this object. I then looked at it and I was like glaring at it. Then I waved my hand at it and I, and I said, ah, bullshit. This is what you got me up for, for this crap. <laughs> and then uh, I waved my hand at it again. Then I turned around and I walked up the stairs and I went to bed. I put my hands on my chest and I was immediately put to sleep. Now, 45 minutes later, when I woke up, I was now fully conscious. And I was like, you know, what the, you know, what? What was that? <laughs> and, and I ran down the stairs. And then my wife was like in the middle of the living room saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, the angels cured her, the angels cured her. And she was like looking up, like, like talking to, to God, you know. And the dog was running around the whole living room um, uh, like a little puppy. She was, she was still the same size, the same age, you know, as before, but with the energy and the flexibility of, of, a, of a teenager. <clears throat> and so um, in my head, um, you could imagine it was like an atom bomb exploded in your head, you know, and like, you know, in, uh, it was like a few seconds of total bewilderment where I didn't even say anything. I'm just trying to comprehend what's going on. So I told my wife, I said, where were you? Where did you go? And she goes, um, I didn't go anywhere. What are you talking about? I said, well, you just disappeared in front of me and the dog, you know, and she goes, I didn't disappear in front of you. And then um, uh, she starts to tell me what she saw. Her angels came and then she began to describe it.
And then I told her, I didn't see what you saw. What I saw was something different. And I, you know, and then both of us drew what we saw. And it was two totally different things. And um, it wasn't until six months later that after we had um, like our third major experience um, that uh, I had called this organization called MUFON, which investigates uh, UFO cases, because I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was on the Internet. You know, uh, initially it was paranormal because I thought it was paranormal related. But she had also said in Spanish that it looked like a little craft and and insisting that there were little people inside, you know. And so I said, but wait a second, this can't be UFOs because UFOs are very large and they're outside, you know. So it was initially paranormal with a little bit of UFO stuff on the Internet. And, and I quickly realized it was all rubbish that was on the Internet. So anyway, after our third major experience, I called this organization and they sent a retired school teacher and her husband was a retired scientist from the, um, um, the hurricane center. I think it's called OSHA is the agency that deals with atmospheric uh, yeah, conditions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or NOAA and, maybe, the national. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I forgot the formal name. Right. But, uh, he worked for the, the hurricane center here in sure. Miami. So he, which he is, was an, which an, is an atmospheric Which is pretty busy at the moment because there's a big Correct. hurricane now, right off the coast. As, as, we, <laughs> as we speak right now, yeah. it's right off the coast. Hurricane Dorian. Uh, and so anyway, they, they both were here. And she had been researching um, UFOs and people that have had close contact experiences for many, many years. And she was the one that told me, Ray, what your wife had is, uh, is called missing time. I had no idea what that was. And she then went to explain it. And uh, I later subsequently found out, including our research study, that it's a very, very common phenomenon. Um, and so my, my wife, basically, to her, she had gone down the stairs. She looked down. The dog was running around. And she started celebrating. Okay. Even though she was gone. And we knew it was 45 minutes because I looked at the... Uh, um, the, the time that she had come up to to pull me out of bed, which is 6 o'clock. And then the time we had gotten downstairs, it was like 6.50 or so. And then five minutes in terms of the initial discussions. So it was like 45 minutes, more or less. And then, um, so after that, I was basically on the internet as much as I could, trying to find out, you know, what the hell is this all about, you know, because I was totally uneducated about these things. And then, um, I'm, and I just should interject I, here yeah. that you told me before we started this recording that your dog lived in perfectly good health for nearly another year. Um, you know, puppy like, even though prior to this event, it had had all the arthritis and everything that you had mentioned. Correct, correct. Yeah. And okay. it lived for about another year. Yeah. And um, um, so the next sequence of events was that uh, a month and a half later, our dog woke my wife up at 3 30. In the morning, that magical witching hour. Okay. <laughs> and um, and so my wife then said, okay, you know, she wants to go to the bathroom. Um, so she uh, went downstairs, obviously not carrying the dog because this dog was still very active. She opened the back door, but the dog that was, did not want to go in the back door. She was jumping on the front door. And um, the dog never did that unless we had a chain that we were going out for a walk or we were going to go to the car. And so... Um, so she was jumping on the front door. So my wife opened the door. The dog ran out. And, um, and so my wife uh, walked down um, three or four steps, which is uh, to our front door. And, um, and then she heard this very, very loud noise for about a minute. And I said, uh, how loud was it? She said it was like a 747 jet was right above her. I said, well, shouldn't, have, shouldn't it have woken up the, the neighborhood? Did you see any lights? She says, no, I didn't see any lights. The, um, and then she said immediately, after the, it stopped after about a minute. Then she looked up, and it was a huge, gigantic UFO. Mm -hmm. It was like the Goodyear blimp. <clears throat> and at the edges of it, at the edges of the blimp, um, um, it had colored lights. And the way she described it to me initially was, oh, my angels came and visited me last night. They came in a beautiful angelic craft and had stained glass windows, just like the stained glass windows of our church. Oh, my angels, you know, that type of thing. And so when I got her to describe it and to draw it out, I said, what you saw was a UFO. You know, these weren't angels. She goes, oh, you wouldn't understand. You're an atheist, you know. <laughs> and so that's when I knew that this was related to UFOs, right? And so then it was like 
eight hours a day on the internet. <laughs> you know, I would order all these UFO books, just trying to understand what the hell is this that we're interacting with. And then um, she then went to Mexico about a month and a half later, and she spent a month there to stay with her family. And uh, she would call her angels repeatedly and repeatedly what appeared a huge UFO, uh, twice seen by her family members. Uh, one time, uh, a UFO uh, uh, interfered with airport traffic in Veracruz Airport. And my wife had called to see her angel. Uh, the UFO never appeared. But in the 11 o'clock news, her sister yelled at her and said, Dulce, Dulce, come here. And, the 11 o'clock news was a huge UFO that interrupted airport traffic for two hours. And then it was in the newspaper the very next day. And then on YouTube, there were many YouTube videos of that night of the YouTube. But my wife didn't tell anybody that she was the one that called it down. <laughs> and, and then she, uh, the next day, she hooked up with a cousin of hers at a baptism because that was one of the reasons why she went down there. And her cousin had told her that she had interacted with many UFOs and the actual entities uh, physically. Uh, uh, mainly the little short ones, and that uh, telepathic communications and even human-looking entities. So then my wife shared her experiences uh, with her. And so, um, and let me then fast forward now about uh, uh, when she r arrived home. Um, this was in um, mid-August. Um, I then uh, playfully called down a UFO. And I started off just killing time because I was waiting for a friend of mine to give me his parking ticket so I could do a motion to consolidate. <laughs> so it was like the last thing in my mind. He wasn't there. I'm waiting and waiting. And I remember seeing a UFO video of this man named Prophet Yahweh who would uh, speak in Hebrew. And a little tiny UFO would appear and he would capture it on his, uh, on his video. And this is in, in daytime, in the middle of the day. And he had numerous videos of daytime video on, on a website that he had started. And the one that captured me was an NBC uh, camera crew that were, you know, mocking him. Oh, and now we're going out to the field to report a so-and-so. And this man claims that he could call a UFO. And after he called it down and they zoomed in on it and you could see this little black speck, you know, moving about, uh, they immediately said, oh, no, back to the office, back to the desk, back to the, it's like totally dismissing it. They didn't want to go near that, you know. And so, um, so I said, okay, let me just kill some time while I'm waiting for my friend. So this is uh, at night, 10 o'clock in the evening. And after like 10 minutes of me trying, uh, I became more sincere as I got into it. And the beginning was killing time, but by the end, it was sort of like a mantra, like a meditation. To uh, I was very, very sincere. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, what a freaking jerk. Here I am calling the, uh, a UFO. I'm going insane. You know, I need <laughs> to stop this thing. Here I am reading all these books. I'm spending all my time on, on the, you know, on the internet. I need to get rid of this stuff because I'm going crazy. And then so, I look sounds up. Sounds like Richard Dreyfuss about halfway through that movie. Well, that's exact. <laughs> well, that's what happened to me later on. Yeah. That's another experience yeah. that dealt with near death experiences. Mm. Uh, and that's how they gave me spirituality. But, but basically um, uh, what had happened was uh, as soon as I thought that I looked up and right on top of my next door neighbor's house, next door neighbor, five feet from his roof was um, a UAP, an unidentified aerial phenomenon. It wasn't fully uh, materialized. Uh, um, if you can imagine sort of like a, full, a small football stadium, maybe like, um, like a small college or a very large high school football stadium um, that was literally right on top of my next door neighbor's house. Let me and, interject uh, a question here, yeah. um, which probably some people are wondering, and that is, wouldn't something like that have been picked up on radar and, you know, by the military and by the, you know, the air traffic control and all that stuff? Or, or is it sort of on a subtler level that you were able to see, but that wouldn't be detectable by that, those instruments? Okay, let me describe what, what I, not only what I saw, but my daughter and three other friends. Okay. okay? It was, um, uh, if you could imagine what I'm depicting, if you could uh, imagine um, uh, streaks of light, white streaks of light that would either do a 90 or a 180 and then continue after like it broke up for a, a certain distance and um, multiply that by hundreds of white streaks of light that would form the whole shell. Of this object so you're seeing the outsides of it okay um, and then inside was all this white plasma energy swirling around 
you could see the stars, excuse me, the clouds, because it was a totally uh, cloudy night. You couldn't see any stars, okay? So you could see the clouds behind it. So it was transparent. Translucent, yeah. Translucent, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but it was huge. It was like 100 meters tall. It went back like 600 meters. So then, uh, to address your listener's question, all of a sudden, I heard a, a voice in my head. And it was my daughter's voice. And the voice said, Daddy, you and Mommy have seen UFOs. Next time you guys see a UFO, you call me. All right, Daddy? Don't forget. Okay? My daughter never said that. But that was what was in my, my mind, in my consciousness. And, and in my head, I, in my consciousness, I was thinking, my daughter needs to see this. My daughter needs to see this. Now, my daughter had just turned uh, 10 years old. Her birthday was July 31st. So this was literally two weeks after she had turned 10 years old. What rational father would want to bring his daughter outside to witness this when you're totally clueless as to what the hell's going on? Okay. But no, but in my mind, my daughter needs to see this because she told me she wanted to see it, right? So I then run to the window. I'm yelling at her. She opens up the window, you know. Mind you, this is like 10 o'clock at night, okay? So uh, it was, a, 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 I think it was a weekend. I'm not sure because she was still up. And so what is it, Daddy? I said, sweetheart, run outside. There's a UFO. There's a UFO outside. Run. So she then, you know, she knew about what my wife had seen, the experience that we had, because we were telling friends over the telephone when friends would come over. So she you know, heard all these stories. So now she runs outside and she's watching this. She says, Daddy, what is that? And I says, sweetheart, it's a UFO, but it's in hiding. It doesn't want to be caught by the military radar and by the airports that we have close by. So that's why it's not fully you know, materialized. That's why it's appearing that way. And she goes, oh, thank you, Ray. Uh, thank you, Daddy. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy. And so um, then uh, we were watching it for like 15 minutes. And uh, what, it, what it was, we weren't scared at all. It was like you're watching the 4th of July fireworks. You're just like with your tongue hanging out, you know, that type of thing. And then my friend comes, and he comes with his wife and their 17-year-old daughter. Okay, they leave the car right in the middle of, a, of the large cul-de-sac that we live in, and they run to us, and both of them are like, Ray, what the hell is that? What the hell is that? I said, you know damn well what it is, okay? This is all in Spanish. And they said, no, impossible. It can't be. It can't be. So then they tried to explain it away, okay? And they were coming up with uh, one crazy explanation after another, and then I didn't tell them that I called it down because that was too much sensory overload for them, you know? <laughs> And so, um, 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 uh, after like their fourth or fifth explanation, which just became more ludicrous, I started laughing out loud. And in my head, I communicated with these entities. I said, and this is literally what I said. Uh, I said, you better come up with some better shit than this because my friends don't believe you. Okay? And then, that's verbatim what I said. And then, uh, and it wasn't by my mouth, it was just in my mind, I thought this, right? And so immediately, what we were watching, what I described to you, totally stopped, disappeared, and immediately replaced by thousands, and, yeah, I would say thousands of stars that were like 10 times the size of Venus. And, okay? it was a and it was a cloudy night, so, yeah. Totally cloudy night. Right. You know, no, but these are large. So this was like, um, if you get the star of Venus and multiply by 10 or 20, yeah. That would give you an idea of how large these were. Now, each of these stars were blinking on and off, on and off like this, okay, flickering. And, and it occupied the whole insides of this object, okay? Uh, but yet, it was still semi-transparent uh, uh, um, because you could still see the clouds behind it, but these stars were blinking inside of all of this. And then also by certain areas, uh, certain of these stars were like power up, get big very, very large, like the size of the moon, and then get very, very small. And it would be doing that, like three or four stars in sections. Then we'll finish with this section, then it would do that section, then it would do that other section. And then everybody, uh, my friend stopped trying to explain it away because they knew that this was not um, an earthbound experience. <laughs> um, and so, um, and all of us were just with our, uh, with our tongues hanging out. The, the neighbor under that house they were in the window looking at us. Now, the natural thing to do would be to go to them and say, look, Pablo, go outside. 
Look what the hell's on top of your house. Or Pablo and his wife to come outside to us and say, why is my neighbor and his daughter and three strangers looking right above my roof uh, and, and just staring nonstop? Is my house on fire? That never took place. Okay, Remember I told you about getting into your mind, yeah, you know, yeah. controlling your mind? Okay. All of a sudden, my friends tell me, oh, we got to leave, Ray. You know, we got businesses to run. We're very, very busy. Uh, oh, don't worry about that motion to consolidate. I'll prepare it, you know, tonight or tomorrow, and I'll send it to you, you know, with the instructions of what you need to do, okay? And, and I didn't even, you know, like now, it's like, what are you, freaking crazy, man? <laughs> it's like you're leaving now in the middle of this? But no, that didn't even enter your, your mind. Now, all of us had cell phones except my 10-year-old. Okay, uh, the 17 year old had her iPhone in her hand or whatever cell phone she had. I remember she had a nice, large size phone. And uh, you think anyone took a, a video of this or a picture of it? This thing was I could have gotten a rock and hit it. That's how close this thing was. OK, now, in hindsight, it was like, my goodness, if we would have taken a video of this or a picture of it, we would have been on the cover of Time magazine for 12 months straight. You know, we would have been on CNN, MSNBC, whatever, you know, for the next uh, 10 years, you know. But no, no, because these things, uh, your mind is not allowed to go there. Okay. And then the way they got me to leave was um, they put in, into my consciousness that I was being attacked by hundreds of mosquitoes. So I was wearing shorts, a short sleeve shirt, and I was like slapping my legs, slapping my arms. And after like a minute, I couldn't take anymore. So I grabbed my daughter's hand and I said, sweetheart, we got to go inside. These mosquitoes are killing me. So we go inside. The door was wide open the whole time. My wife never went outside. The dog never went outside because the dog, when she hears somebody, she's always barking at the door and you know, trying to chase the, the person down. So uh, that was very, very strange. So I go inside. I'm telling my wife about what happened. She goes, oh, how nice. You know, like she was just coming out of a trance. And then I told her we had to go inside because these mosquitoes were killing me. And then my daughter goes to me, daddy, they were no mosquitoes outside. And as soon as she said that, it was like the amazing Kreskin. I don't know if you remember him, whether you're old enough. Okay. Magician. The magician, he would uh, hypnotize people, and they would right. be walking like 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 ducks on the auditorium. <laughs> yeah. I remember 1975. I was a freshman at Rutgers College, and he had all these some some of the people that I knew, and on other people walking like ducks on stage, you know. <laughs> and as soon as like he snapped his finger because he had given them an instruction, all of a sudden they woke up. So as soon as my daughter said, "Daddy, there were no mosquitoes outside," it was like. The finger was snapped. The hypnotist the finger was snapped. I woke up and I was like, holy shit, what the hell just happened? So I ran downstairs. I grabbed my professional video camera, my professional camera. I ran outside, nothing outside. And that's when I figured out for the first time, that was why I acted that way in my living room. Because for six months after that experience, I was like, why did I act that way? I'm a rational person. I'm an intelligent person. Why did I totally dismiss this? Why didn't I think about my wife, care about her? Well, you know, it was like I was like a madman. You know, I couldn't figure it out. And it was then that I figured out, oh, my God, whatever this intelligence is gets into your consciousness, is able to extract your thoughts, and is able to put thoughts into your mind. I said, my goodness, you know. <laughs> Uh, and then it was after that experience that it began two and a half years of nonstop paranormal experiences. And one of those was how Free was organized in three days with um, Edgar Mitchell, uh, Rudy Shield, Dr. Rudy Shields, who is an emeritus professor of astrophysics at Harvard, and Mary Rodwell, who is probably the most um, um, important researcher of UFO contactees in the world, how all of three of them were put in my, uh, uh, in my uh, arena uh, within three days, and free was formed at the home of Edgar Mitchell um, uh, after I had this out-of-body experience while I was driving my car where I was shown the contact modalities. So it was all orchestrated. And uh, you can get Rudy Shields on your show. He'll, he'll be a wonderful guest. Um, he's an 80-year-old uh, uh, emeritus professor of astrophysics at Harvard for 45 years. He was a professor there, um, and he's deeply into the topics of consciousness and, and contact. Mm. Or Mary Rodwell, who has worked with experience, and they will tell you what I just told you is correct. Great. Um, I imagine that 
people listening to this, either live or later on, um, there'll be a whole range, naturally, of people who think that this is just fantasy thinking, you know, imagination, to those who take it very literally and, you know, feel that, you know, yeah, this stuff is happening and uh, we've known about it for a long time. So, um, you know, we'll kind of swing back and forth on that spectrum, sure, perhaps, sure, sure. perhaps, and uh, offer some some stuff that might convince the more skeptical people. But we also want to get, you know, deeply into some of the more philosophical or spiritual implications of all this without, oh, yes. without eating up all our time just asking, you know, the question of whether it's real or not. So yep. we'll do that. We'll do both. <laughs> um, a couple of nice quotes here. I'll give your voice a break for a second and just read these uh, that capture my sentiment about all this. One is from Harvard psychiatrist John Mack, who worked with approximately 200 ind individuals who claimed um, to have contact with non-human intelligence. And he concluded that the beings, quote, are forcing us to appreciate that cosmic realities exist beyond the three-dimensional universe that has bounded our earthly existence, end quote. And I'm getting these from your book. And here's another one from Kenneth Ring, who is a professor of psychiatry, I believe, at the University of Connecticut, who did a lot of research in this area. His belief that these sightings and related uh, experiences are intended to serve as, quote, agents of cultural deconstruction, end quote, to change our culture and belief systems and make us more open to alternative ways of thinking about reality. So um, according to these two gentlemen, and I'm sure you would agree with them, uh, the whatever these beings are, they're not just tourists and they're or sightseers or explorers in the in the way that some of the early you know explorers traveled around and discovered other continents from Europe and so on. Um, but they have an agenda or a mission which is to help humanity evolve and to help bring about certain changes in our behavior, in our consciousness, in our thinking. And um, you've collected a lot of evidence that tends to support this. And um, there's, there's also a certain faction, uh, perhaps even in the majority, if you look at all the popular movies that have been made and a lot of the YouTube videos that are out there, who feel that, yeah, these beings are, they exist, but they have a negative agenda. Um, they want to kill us all. They want to, you know, just to harvest all the Earth's natural resources or something and then go about their merry way. Um, but what your studies show, and we, we haven't even begun to talk about your studies yet, but we'll get into that, is that um, all kinds of very beneficial changes have taken place in the minds and the psychologies of those who have had these kinds of experiences, uh, such as concern with spiritual matters, desire to help others, compassion for others, ability to love others, concern for the welfare of the planet, conviction that there is life after death, tolerance of others, and insight into the problems of others, among many other things. Um, so it seems like, although some people, you know, a small percentage said they were primarily terrified or that they would like it to stop, the majority, uh, in the, and I'll let you in just a second tell, tell us how extensive this study was and what it was, but the majority have said, oh, it was a really positive experience, it changed my life for the better, and I don't want it to stop. Uh, so um, if these people had a nefarious or undesirable motive, I say people, if these beings, whatever they are, uh, had uh, ill intentions, then it would say, what was it? Christ said, a, a, a house divided itse against itself cannot stand. He was accused of being able to do what he was doing by virtue of the power of the devil or something. And he said, well, if I were the devil, that wouldn't work because I'm doing all these good works and uh, therefore I'd be divided against, you know, the devil would be sort of undermining his purpose by doing good works. So it's, it seems like, you know, these intelligences are largely, according to your studies, having a, a salutary effect, a beneficial effect. And that would tend to give us more confidence in their motivation. All right. So that was a bit of a long-winded comment on my part. But um, why don't you respond to that and get us into um, kind of an overview of what this study was, how extensive it was, who worked on it with you, how you managed to collect all these people. And, and before you do that, I might say that I bet you all the people who participated in your study, and there were thousands, were actually just a small percentage of the total number of people in the world who have had this kind of experience. These are just the people you managed to connect with who took the trouble to fill out the study. But it seems to be a pretty widespread phenomenon. 
Yes, I, I would agree. Yes, it is indeed a very widespread phenomenon, and it's part of what later on hopefully we'll uh, discuss the contact modalities and the work of this new organization. Yes. It's, um, as, as you might suspect, uh, historically individuals have interacted with non-human intelligence via many different modalities. The quote-unquote UFO-related type of phenomenon um, is most recently popularized, um, uh, but it was uh, never studied before the experiencer of that phenomenon, never. There was zero data on that phenomenon. So uh, what had happened was, um, I'm not going to go into the detail of the experience that led in the three-day period to the formation of this organization, but uh, uh, within a few short months of that experience, which occurred in May of 2013, we had numerous PhD academic professors that were willing to join us uh, in this mission. And the mission was, uh, how do you begin to undertake the world's first comprehensive academic research study of individuals that had both seen UFOs and have had uh, contact with non-human intelligence? had never been done before. So the people that are, uh, the professors that agreed to, bar to work with us were uh, Dr. John Klimo. Uh, Dr. John Klimo was a professor of psychology for over 45 years. And um, he was one of the pioneers of, you know, modern academic paranormal research together with uh, Charles Tart, um, Stanley Krippner, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He was part of that, that core group. He knows these two individuals as very close friends for 40 years. And uh, he was a tenured professor, and and he uh, has written extensively about consciousness, uh, dreams, about death, uh, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, about the psi phenomenon, et cetera, et cetera. So he um, eventually uh, became the co-chair of our research study. Uh, we already spoke about Edgar Mitchell, uh, who got a PhD in astro in aeronautical engineering from MIT and was the founder of the Institute for Noetic Sciences. Uh, Rudy Shield, who uh, you had mentioned, John Mack, he was the one that introduced Dr. John Mack uh, about the topic of consciousness. Uh, before that, uh, 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 Mack did not understand the physics aspects of consciousness, and it was Rudy who was one of his best friends uh, at Harvard and one of the few that actually defended him at, at Harvard in terms of the academics uh, to begin to engage in the dialogue about the physics of consciousness. John, Dr. John Mack was, in, was studying alien abduction people, wasn't he? Didn't he? Wasn't he like in touch with Betty and Barney Hill, and then he was... Well, yeah, yeah at, at, at first he was introduced to the topic mm -hmm. uh, by um, uh, this man um, who, uh, uh, who was not an academic. He was researching abductions, and he viewed these experiences as mainly, mainly negative. <clears throat> it was Bud Hopkins, okay? So Bud Hopkins would begin to send him the people that he had uh, um, hypnotically regressed and gave it to John Mack. But then after John Mack published uh, his initial book titled Abductions, all of a sudden he had hundreds of people going to him and once uh, in totally independent of Bud Hopkins. And then the second wave of individuals had totally different stories from what Bud Hopkins had given him. These are people that were having, um, you know, um, uh, um, the contact modalities, people having out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences. They were brought to other matrix realities. These experiences were initially frightening because it scared them, but it became uh, a much more spiritually awakening, spiritually transformative for them. And that's when he began to realize that these were possibly multidimensional uh, entities that people are dealing with and that totally transforming humanity. But he passed away before he was. Uh, he he did write a book titled "Passport to the Cosmos," which has this uh, presented this new paradigm. But uh, it was as soon as he published that book, he he got into an accident uh, um, and he he died. And so, but most of this field of ufology, it's uh, most of it is abductions, abductions, negative, negative. But there was never any type of data to be able to substantiate one position or another. So uh, we ha also had Dr. Claude Swanson, PhD physicist from Princeton University, um, who is very much interested into consciousness and the contact modalities, and also UFO contact. Uh, he joined us. Dr. Bob Davis, who was a PhD, retired PhD professor of neuroscience 
at the State University of New York. Uh, he taught there for 35 years as a tenured faculty member, very much interested in these topics. And uh, we brought in a couple of other professors, like a retired professor, um, Leo, uh, um, Leo Sprinkle, who's one of the first academics actually have an article published on UFO contact experiencers. Uh, consultants were um, uh, Dean Radin, who just mentioned before, um, and, and several other academics. And then we brought in uh, researchers, people who had their boots on the ground that were working with experiencers. One was Kathy Martin, who wrote the book on Benny and Barney Hill. Um, um, so a major researcher, um, uh, also um, um, Mary Rodwell, who I had mentioned before, and a couple of other individuals. So what we did basically is to get these PhD academics who were interested in this topic together with the people that I had interviewed uh, thousands of cases of, of experiencers. And we got them both together and say, okay, how do you begin to study this phenomenon of UFO contact experiencers? And so what we developed was three surveys, uh, two uh, um, quantitative uh, surveys uh, comprised of 600 questions. And then we had one survey which was qualitative in nature, which was written responses to 70 open-ended questions. And then um, we had the surveys translated into different languages. But what I'm going to talk to you about was, is uh, our English language survey. Um, we publicized the hell out of it throughout Facebook, over 200 radio shows, um, paranormal radio shows, UFO radio shows, conscious this radio show similar to what we're doing now uh, to encourage people to take our survey. And uh, what we wound up with was uh, 4,200 responses from individuals from over um, 100 countries. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, what we found out um, from, uh, from our surveys, uh, let me just briefly go over four major findings. There's naturally hundreds of different, you know, topics we can go in here because we ask so many different questions. But if you were to say, Ray, what are your four major findings? I would say, number one, um, while initially 37% viewed their experiences as highly negative, okay, in the very beginning, now when they were taking their survey, it was between 85 to 95% of these individuals said it was mainly positive, okay? And um, so there was a whole transition uh, of of how that took place and why it took place, which I, I could go into. We asked that question of positive, negative, neutral in, in over 25 different questions because how you ask a question, you get a different response. We even ask a question for the different types of quote-unquote beings that people interacted with. Was their experience uh, um, mainly negative, slightly negative, neutral, slightly uh, positive, or or mainly positive? Okay, and then we asked it, you know, initially, and then later on w with the beings, and what we found out was that the overwhelming number of these people said, "Look, it wasn't negative." Um, actually, for the certain types of beings, it was mainly neutral. Um, um, so that was a complete revelation for many of the folks. They they knew that this was happening via the experiences, but it was never quantified. Because if you go to the internet, all you read is that th these are all negative, 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 negative. Well, we documented with 4,200 experiences, it's the total opposite. People are uh, now, towards the end, are perceiving their experiences as mainly positive. Even though in the beginning, they were traumatized because of the ontological shock of seeing a physical being in front of you. Okay, so that was one one finding. The other finding was that um, these experiences were totally transformative. You had read some of those uh, comments of how people changed uh, earlier. What we did was um, we utilized over 60 questions that Dr. Kenneth Ring used for um, a statistical study that he did in 19, he published it in 1988. I believe it began in 1985. <clears throat> now, Dr. Kenneth Ring is one of the pioneers of near-death experience research. Uh, he has published numerous books and, and many, many articles on NDE experiences. And uh, now uh, he's in his early 80s, retired professor from the University of Connecticut. And so in that book, uh, which he published in 1988, the book is titled The Omega Project. 
Okay. Um, uh, in that book, he compared roughly 85 individuals that had near-death experiences with 85 people that had abduction experiences. And one of the components of his research was, how do these people change? And so he asked the same questions to both groups. And what he found out? 85%. 75 to 85 percent, depending on the question that was asked, totally transformed themselves in both groups. You would expect that from the NDE group, but also from the abduct abduction group. People did, did not fear death. They became less materialistic, less egotistical, more loving and caring of uh, the, their fellow human being, more ecological. They didn't care about being famous, much more consciously aware. They now had a mission in life, a purpose in life. It was like 60 questions similar to this. So what happened is that um, you first started off as a caterpillar, okay? And by the end of these experiences, when people are taking these surveys, they're like a butterfly, totally enlightened, became more spiritual. It was like 85% of these people became more spiritual, much more spiritual, okay? And less religious. Okay. Now, there's a, a, a group, maybe 30% of the people that remained religious. Okay. They would, like my wife, for example, they would still go to church. But, but now they understand that, that church is much, much more comprehensive than what they initially thought it was. So, um, what we did is we borrowed his questions with his permission, and he actually wrote an endorsement of our book as well, Dr. Kenneth Ring, and together with Dean Radin. And, um, and what did we find? But not with 85 plus 85, 170 people. No. Now we had 4,200 people saying the same exact thing. Okay? Roughly 85% of these people were totally transformed. Uh, um, not only spiritually, but in terms of their own mindset, their own modality of, of life, how they viewed life, their reality, how they changed, how they behaved. It's like a total behavioral modification. Um, so that was the second major finding. The third major finding was that these experiences, while um, indeed they are physical in nature, the physicality of these experiences is very minute. The overwhelming majority of these experiences are quote unquote paranormal in nature. Okay. We asked close to 100 questions related to the paranormal. And again, that's not the proper term, paranormal, but for the audience members to, to understand it. Um, all different types of altered states of consciousness. For example, 80% of these individuals have had an out-of-body experience. 37% have had a near-death experience. 50% uh, 50 have been medically healed by non-human intelligence. 67% have seen orbs, physically orbs. Uh, almost 70% have seen and interacted with a ghost or a spirit. Huge numbers we're talking about. Um, you name the, 95% uh, said that they've had paranormal experiences in their homes. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, and then the other aspect that you talked about was the messages that people are receiving. Okay, uh, you name the gambit. Okay, um, in terms of the messages, the the gambit deals with um, you're destroying our planet. The main these are the two main <clears throat> topics that people are getting information on. The two main topics: one is you're destroying your planet. Okay, and you're destroying yourselves. Okay, in the meantime, so you need to change before it's too late. That's number one. Number two, you need to become more spiritual. Okay. Because you cannot go to the direction of trying to save your planet and saving yourselves if you don't become more spiritual. Okay? Now, they weren't, they're not talking about religion here, obviously. You know? They're talking about that we are, are living in a multidimensional reality. And then within this multidimensional reality, uh, there are different levels of, of understandings of realities and, and non-human intelligence are occupying uh, these different realms and that uh, they um, have a better understanding of source and, and spirituality. Also, when, what happens to us when we die, how we need to change to become more loving, okay? Uh, but yet, in order for, take, for us to take the next step, 
the next stage of evolution, we need to move into that direction. And so the general category that people put it in is this category of spirituality. But it's much, much more profound and complicated than just, you know, the afterlife, even though that's a major component of it. And um, and then the third major uh, uh, um, uh, ex, uh, uh, finding is that these experiences are multidimensional in nature. Why? Because there's a manipulation of space-time. And if you look at all of the contact modalities, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, mystical meditation, communication with ghosts uh, uh, and spirits, um, um, hallucinogenic journeys, et cetera, et cetera, all of them involve a manipulation of space-time. And that leads then to the hypothesis that we're dealing with a multidimensional reality. Um, all of our physicists uh, hypothesize that, okay, in our group. We have three PhD physicists. And, and what they have told me is that, uh, Ray, if you graduate now with a PhD in theoretical physics, you're going to be an adherent to a multiverse theory. That means that we don't live in one reality, okay? So this is now almost every PhD physicist understands it, acknowledges it, and accepts it. But yet the normal human being in this planet has no conceptualization of that, okay? And so when you're talking about out-of-body experiences, uh, like these skeptics that are out there, you know, is Ray Hernandez lying and making these things up? I wish that you have an out-of-body experience, okay? I wish that you have a near-death experience because after you've had these experiences and you return back to your physical body, all of a sudden, you lose all your skepticism. <laughs> and you also understand that we're not just flesh and bone, that there's something else to us. There's a, if you want to call it a spirit, a soul, whatever you might want to call it, but we're much more than just a, a, a flesh and bones. And so... Um, uh, so our research study on the UFO contact experiences, the importance of that, is that most of the field of ufology still doesn't understand what we, what we did, why, what the questions that we asked, and totally will not accept our research findings. They said this is woo woo science. We asked all new agers, you know, uh, new age folks, you know, our surveys, um, and because these folks are are material rationalists, okay, to them the field of ufology is nuts and bolts, um, pictures and videos of UFO crafts or conspiracy theories. That's what that genre is all about. And so what what we discovered via four thousand. 200 people that have had these direct experiences that all these so-called experts in the field of ufology, they're all totally clueless, <laughs> totally clueless as to what really is going on and what it, uh, what, it, what it has more in common with is the out-of-body experiencers, the near-death experiencers, the remote viewing, the mystical meditators, the, the, the channelers, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be able to be able to understand this genre of the UFO uh, aspects of it within a much, much more larger umbrella. And that was the, the vision that I was given when I was taken out of body driving my car, that all of these contact modalities are interrelated, that humans are studying them as separate and distinct phenomenon, but we need to be able to study them as one phenomenon. And that consciousness, humans are calling it consciousness, but in reality is the fabric of our reality is the glue that's holding it all together. And in order for you to have a better understanding of these separate, you know, phenomena, we need to be able to study it as one phenomena. Yeah. All righty. Um, let me respond to that with something that will kind of be combined uh, comment yeah. and question. Um, I wrote this down the other day and I emailed it to you, and that is that, um, you know, it seems that ETs, NDEs, near-death near experiences, out-of-body experiences, meditative experiences, many mystical experiences are related through a common denominator, namely that they all involve access to subtler realms. And I'm completely yeah. comfortable with the notion of subtler realms. We talk about it a lot on this show. Um, but despite that common denominator, they can still be dissimilar in certain ways. For instance, to take an analogy, um, you know, baseball and mountain climbing and boxing and scuba diving are all sports but they're obviously very different from one another. So there could be subtle beings who reside on Earth. I have friends who perceive them routinely. And then there could be 
ETs, if we want to call them that, who visit from elsewhere in the universe, and yet uh, they do so by accessing subtler dimensions, thus enabling them to overcome the speed of light barrier. Um, and uh, I asked a friend of mine about this just the other day who um, it lives in India and um, has had some very profound, beautiful um, experiences with high spiritual beings most of his life. And he put it in this way. He said, suffice it to say that the, the Lord's divine maya is vast and very difficult to comprehend and consists of many different types of worlds and beings, some of which are imperceptible to us here, others are perceptible. The perceptible worlds and beings can be reached by vehicular technologies, the others cannot. Um, so in other words, depending on who they are and where they're coming from, they may need a vehicle to get here, um, or it may be that they're already here, just as we are, but they just live on a subtler dimension uh, of life, and so don't ordinarily, aren't ordinarily perceptible to the average person, but they don't need a vehicle to get here because they live here as much as we do. <laughs> so uh, how does that all strike you? No, I mean, these are all viable hypotheses. Yeah, good. And, and at this point... Um, Humanity is totally clueless as to the fundamental questions to ask on these topics. Um, and that's going to be what we're going to be doing with this new organization, which we can, you know, transcend to later on. But, um, but yes, uh, it's a dilemma that, uh, at least within the field of ufology, let me talk about that. Dr. Jacques Vallée, um, one of the pioneers of, of this arena, he's written over 15 books. And he was the guy again, who was played, who, who, whose character in Close Encounters of the Third Kind was that Frenchman, right? In, in, correct, correct. Yeah, the, that the was French, supposed to be Jacques Frenchman. Vallée, yeah. Correct. He, he's, he's given a recent TEDx talk on consciousness and the multiverse, you know, in terms of speculative theories. Um, he's lectured over 40 years ago that um, this might not be an ET coming from a physical reality, uh, something he suspects is much more complicated. And also that's a conclusion that Dr. Alan Hynek, who's basically the godfather of ufology, reached in the latter years of, of, uh, of his life, um, that um, this is much, much more you know, uh, 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 complicated than what he initially thought it was. <laughs> and he began to agree with Dr. Jacques Vallée. Uh, the, the dilemma is that, at least in the field of ufology, but also in these other types of uh, uh, experiences like ghosts and spirits and, and, uh, and uh, remote viewing, et cetera, even mystical meditation, is that there's a physicality to these things, okay? You're physically seeing a ghost, okay? You're getting... Um, you know, telepathic communication from this spirit, okay, or even remote viewing or, or channeling mystical meditation. You start off with you, you know, meditating, even an out-of-body experience, you know, you perceiving yourself with, with, um, um, with, uh, um, with perceptions that you would normally have as a human being. You're seeing, you're hearing, you know, um, even though you might not be in the body. So it's both a mixture of physicality and non-physicality. Um, now, what, what what many of, of individuals in our organization suspect, and again, numerous scientists uh, that are in this arena uh, of the contact modalities, is that our brain serves as a filter mechanism, okay, which, um, uh, let me put it this way, uh, the, our reality might be filled with information fields, okay, our reality is, is binary codes out there. Okay, um, Rudy Shields and most of the astrophysicists conjecture that black holes are actually information storage devices. Okay, Rudy was the first one to hypothesize that. Okay, and with mathematics and physics, later Stephen Hawking uh, uh, agreed with that, um, and many other physicists. Okay, so if if it's crazy enough to think of black holes as information storage devices. Also, many other astrophysicists talked about our cosmology as uh, having what is called zero-point energy fields, which is, you know, inform uh, information is stored there. Now, the, the way we as humans tap into that these subtler realms of reality um, uh, is that um, uh, we have certain triggering mechanisms. Like, for example, people that become advanced meditators, all of a sudden, they pop out of their body, Okay. Uh, all of a sudden, they're having an out-of-body experience. Then they journey to other realms. Or people, when they have a near-death experience, all of a sudden, they return. They're seeing ghosts and spirits. They're having paranormal experiences. They're, they're having a paranormal life, okay? People that are advanced OBE experiencers, 
Also, I've talking, spoken with hundreds of them as well. These people are living paranormal experiences. Okay? Once they learned how to pop out of their body when they were young and making these journeys, all of a sudden, the brain is not um, a concrete block anymore. Now it's like sand <laughs> or information from, um, you know, that you can describe it as zero-point energy fields information is uh, seeping in. So whatever these subtle realms are, it, it, it's not like they're, 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 they're separated by space, okay? It's, um, it, it's separated by, by consciousness, really, you know, us being able to tap into these other realms. So, um, so yes, everything that you just quoted, um, these are all viable hypotheses and things that um, I generally tend to agree with. Um, but what, what we're going to be doing with this new organization, uh, Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, CCRI, is um, I've um, helped to assemble of 15 brilliant minds that are, uh, are interested in exploring what is the relationship between consciousness, uh, our cosmology, and contact with non-human intelligence via the contact modalities. You know, um, what is the interrelationship here? They, they understand that there's so many similarities, but yet there are differences, like you just alluded to, to some of them. So um, um, for, uh, let me give you a background for this, okay? Um, most individuals in these um, contact modalities fields, for example, the UFO folks, they just stick to UFOs, okay? The NDE folks, they just stick to NDEs. The psi phenomenon, like the parapsychologists, they just stick with, you know, parapsychology, you know? The remote viewers, they just stick to remote viewing, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But yet, when you get them all in one room, they're all talking about very similar topics and concepts, they, among themselves, they have these conversations about the interrelationships, but no one has ever written an academic article about the interrelationships of it, and no one, let alone doing a formal comprehensive academic research study on this. Now, for your audience members, let me just define the contact modalities. I've sort of alluded to it, but basically, it would be all the different ways that humans are piercing the veal, quote-unquote, and having contact with non-human intelligence, uh, i.e., UFO contact, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, communication with ghosts and spirits, mystical meditations, uh, channeling, uh, hallucinogenic uh, uh, journeys, uh, orbs, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there, there are several others, okay? But just so you can get an idea. Now, what, um, for example, let me just give you a couple of comparisons between near-death experiences and, um, and UFO contact, okay? In both phenomenon, how does communication take place? Mind to mind, telepathic, okay? Is communication in your native language? overwhelming majority of people say yes in your native language, okay? We've got that comparative data because we have did our research study in multiple languages with the UFO aspect of it. Same thing with the near-death experience. The near-death experience literature reveals that among the different countries, communication takes place in an NDE in their native language, okay? Um, and telepathically. Number, uh, what also, what we discovered was that three out of the top four type of entities, beings, that people are seeing in UFO contact, i.e. the energy being, the human looking being, and ghosts and spirits, are the top three that people are seeing in near-death experiences, okay? Um, the transformation of the people. People are totally transformed by it, and I alluded to it, uh, discussed it before. The whole aspect of um, out-of-body experiences. I mentioned before, 80% of the people in UFO contact have had out-of-body experiences. NDEs, most of the NDEs start with what? With an OBE. You're physically, you see your dead body underneath you. Okay, with both groups, people are taken to what I call a matrix reality, a, a three-dimensional reality. Okay, fifty percent of the people in our survey, fifty percent, have been brought to a matrix reality. Okay, and you're listening to them; it's like they were taken to an NDE kind of, except they didn't have you know deceased relatives or an entity that they define as God, you know, interacting with them. They had like a mind that's interacting with these people, teaching them lessons, showing them different things, you know? Let, um, me, let me pop in a question here. That, yeah, uh, without, and, 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 and there's ahead. numerous other commonalities, but that's just for the listeners to get uh, a very simplistic understanding of some of the similarities, but I could go on and on and on with the similarities. Well, you still can't. I don't want to break your 
train okay, of thought, okay, okay. But, but there's a question that came to mind, and that is that, you know, if somebody has a, let's say, a, a near-death experience, they're undergoing surgery, and they die and go through a tunnel and see their relatives and all kinds of things. All right, so that's one thing that happens. Or they have an out-of-body experience, like, uh, well, that also happens. They're, they're undergoing surgery, and they, the next thing you know, they're up in the ceiling looking at the surgeons <laughs> working on them. Um, both of those things seem like... Um, you know, things that are just happening to them without the intercession necessarily of other types of beings, although they might encounter other beings when they have those experiences. Not, not necessarily. No? There's a very okay. high percentage of these types of OBE type of experiences that there's an entity that they perceive or physically see with them, like a, um, um, a, a non-human intelligence in the image of um, like a, a spirit. Mm -hmm. That people see, or they know that that human that entity is there because it's communicating with them while they're out of body. Right. So it's not just that they're they're out of body and there's no communication, any relationship with non-human intelligence. No, 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 no I'm not suggesting that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, or somebody like Anita Murjani, whom I've interviewed, who you know had nearly died and you know met her father and various other beings on the other side and then yeah. came back. So there's but, but that. We're talking about at the OBE stage. Right. Right. That Context starts even at that stage. Yeah, but then there seems to be a little bit of a distinction between that, although we're talking about similar um, phenomena or mechanics here, and the kind of thing you described where um, some being came to you in some kind of craft and it was very much well, in Well, not necessarily a craft. Or some kind of something, that little yeah. U-shaped yeah. upside down you in your living room or the big thing yeah. over your yeah. neighbor's house or something. Some and, type of not human intelligence. Yeah, but in any case, in that, in that case, it seems like they are, we're dealing there with types of intelligence that have actually mastered these realities and can navigate through subtler realms and, and come and visit people and, and know what's in their minds and have some kind of influence on their minds and get them to do things this way and that. Um, so it almost seems like the one is kind of like a little bit of a an accidental thing, like Danny and Brinkley getting struck by lightning and and you know having a near death experience. Whereas the other is um, kind of like beings who have mastered the technology of of subtler dimensions, so to speak, and uh, are able to navigate and go here and there and do this and that by virtue of that mastery. Do you feel like that's a legitimate um, distinction or or? Well, it gets even more complicated than that, okay? okay? Our survey has revealed that an actual physical being, um, the vast majority of people that took our survey saw an actual physical being, okay? Flesh and However, blood like you and I or kind of a th ethereal somewhat? But both, both. Oh, okay. okay? Mm -hmm. Now, but what has happened is that as they continue with their experiences, they're also interacting with intelligences that are not there, Okay. So something is not there, but yet it's communicating to you. Uh -huh. So you don't see you're it, or you don't down. sense anything through any of your senses, but Co still there's this communication going on. Correct, correct. Okay. Right. Um, and then people are, are, um, are interacting literally with like thousands of different types of perceived physical entities. For example, which I suspect that these are projections, holographic projections, that it's not like that real physical entity was there. Okay. Not all of them, but at least some of these experiences, like for example, okay, there's, there's this man here in Miami who's come to be my best friend, okay? He's the world number one contact experiencer uh, by far, okay? Um, and um, uh, he's a retired federal DEA federal agent. His wife is a PhD psychologist. His daughter's a PhD psychologist. These are highly educated individuals. His okay? name isn't William by any chance, is it? No, no. Okay, good, because I have a list of questions from a William in Miami that I'm going to ask you a little, in a little bit later. Okay, okay. <laughs> and so uh, this man and his wife have seen Ganesh uh -huh. physically yeah. in their bed, not while they were asleep. It wasn't a lucid dream. This is like, you know, they were startled because they see this big, huge light, and then they wake up, and there's Ganesh right in front of them. Now, did Ganesh come from the Ganesh constellation? Okay. They also saw Anubis, the Egyptian god with the dog head. Now, did Anubis come from the Anubis constellation? Mm. Okay. So these are like archetypes. Name, uh, cor they, correct. Right. Uh, 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 people have literally described in our research study literally more than a thousand different types of physical types of entities. So, so you could either take the position that, yes, this physical entity was very, very real and he came from whatever reality he came from, okay? Or you could say that maybe some of them 
are real and the rest are projections. For example, I won't mention the name of this very, very famous person, very well known, okay? He and his wife saw a six-foot owl, okay, on their vanity, you know, bathroom vanity. Yeah. These are millionaires type people, okay? And and it wasn't like I heard it third hand. This is direct from the horse's mouth, as they say. Okay. So did that six foot owl come from the six foot owl dimension? Or or these, you know, projections for that serve a purpose, whatever the purpose that is. Okay. Now, in terms of um um what we're dealing with. Okay, my response to whoever is asking all these questions is, uh, and all these questions that people are submitting to you, is is at this point we're dealing with something that is so freaking complicated, okay, that we can't even begin to understand what are the basic questions to ask regarding to this because it's like you're prying into what is consciousness itself, you know that that's how deep this is, okay. What we can do, uh, at least what we could try to do, with, at least with the UFO aspect of it, is to document. What are people experiencing? What are they telling us and trying to document? And now we want to move into the contact modalities to see the people. For example, this is the, the typical case of, of these individuals, okay? And my friend who's here in Miami has the same thing. They've had almost every one of the contact modalities, okay? The, um, I've interacted with three physicians. These are physicians, Okay, these are not senile people that are 90 years old, 80 years old. They're still practicing physicians, okay? They've had near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, ghosts and spirits. For example, one, uh, two physicians, they've had, well, after their NDE, all of a sudden they began to see ghosts and spirits in their hospital, okay? And I spoke with a, a couple of researchers on NDEs, and I said, that's, I've spoken with a lot of medical doctors, <laughs> okay, o- over the years. They've told me the same thing. And and not only that, but also other NDE experiencers, okay, um, and OBE experiencers, and also UFO contact experiencers, that somehow there's a triggering event that just opens up this whole um, fabric of reality, and everything else comes comes trickling in. So um, um, I, uh, I um, this person has seen Sasquatch. A physical Sasquatch with her husband. They seen a huge UFO the size of uh, that blotted out all the stars in the sky, a triangle twice with her husband. Okay, and so you're listening to this person and you're saying, you know, is is this person for real? That I met the the person at a conference, the doctor. She gave me her business card and she started talking in medical terms about her NDE. I had to stop her. Excuse me, doctor. I don't understand all the medical jargon, you know? So I, that's when I knew that she wasn't crazy, that these are very, very real. And then you think about your own personal experiences, which is absolutely crazy, you know, for you to anyone else to digest. And you say, my goodness, you know, there's so many people like this medical doctor, okay? Now, how do you understand that? Someone that's having all of these diverse experiences. That's why we want to be able to study because that person, that medical doctor, and hundreds like her that I've interacted with, and there's probably, um, who knows, maybe a million people all over the world, okay? These people, we believe, all of the researchers, and hopefully I'll get to name some of these people in our organization, we believe that these people hold the key to understanding what is consciousness because they literally have been in in all these realms via many different ways, (laughs) all right? So it's like if we can pry open the door to understand these people and understand the phenomenon and how they're all interrelated, we would have a better understanding of what is consciousness. It's really cool what you're doing because it's like, it seems like these experiences are, are ubiquitous. People all over the world are having all these kinds of fire experiences, and you know, including many quote unquote respectable people, you know, well educated doctors and this and that. And yet, everybody's afraid to co- totally come out with it. And oh, yes. if, if that, everyone did that, that if simultaneously, I can interrupt you for a second. yeah, sure, go ahead. Most of the folks that took our survey stated they've never spoken to anyone else about their experiences except their immediately family members. Yeah. So that's why it remains hidden. And here's a question that is related to that that came in from my friend Dan in London. He said, given the amount of evidence you have for this phenomenon, this phenomenon, and the amount of highly respected individuals involved in the research, why do you think this is not yet accepted in the mainstream? Is there not evidence that is irrefutable that can be presented to the mainstream media? It seems that this type of knowledge experience has the potential to positively transform humanity. Do you think the day 
when this is accepted in the mainstream is very far away. And it seems to me like it's, it's kind of like this, everybody, I don't know, it's like the emperor's new clothes or something. Everybody's having this experience <laughs> yes. and nobody, everybody's afraid to say it, but there could be some kind of tipping point, man. Perhaps your research will help to expedite this or catalyze it uh, at which we cross that tipping point and, and it becomes de rigueur, you know, it becomes the norm for people to acknowledge this stuff and everybody starts sharing their experiences and then it becomes part of our more conscious shared experience of humanity. Yeah, I mean, the way I could uh, answer that question is um, uh, I read when I was in college this very important book titled The, the, the Structure uh, of Scientific Revolution. Oh, yeah, Thomas Kuhn, great book. By Thomas Kuhn, okay? It talked about how new paradigms are established. And it talked about initially when these crazy radical ideas are, are brought forth, it's totally destroyed and dismissed by the scientific um, um, uh, academia, okay? Then later on, as the folks begin dying out, new scientists begin to become more receptive to these topics, okay? And um, what we're going to be doing with our research study is that we're establishing a new paradigm of our reality, okay? And in the, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult for a materialist, and you certainly can understand these concepts. Um, most of the folks in our organization, including most of the major NDE experiencers, uh, researchers, uh, they believe that consciousness is primary, Okay, not our physical material reality, but yet you talk to the normal person out in the street, they have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Okay, um, <laughs> and 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 even within the field of ufology, uh, uh, which we as an organization never were, our focus was on consciousness studies. But when you, um, um, I would make a presentation at these conferences. You have all these very well-known names in the field of ufology. Okay, they're all materialists. Okay. Um, what, what we did was pseudoscience. You know, the survey findings are totally unacceptable. You know, what is this being brought to a matrix reality? What is this, all these paranormal experiences? You know, uh, just like a regular materialist scientist. Uh, uh, so if uh, uh, I went to a conference, let me just tell you, this is in June, the biggest UFO conference in the world called, called Contact in the Desert, okay? And... Um, uh, they had this guy that lectured on the Peruvian skulls, these elongated skulls, which, you know, he he did a DNA test and, and they were proven to be 100% human, you know, DNA, whatever. This guy got 500 people to pack up his room and Ray Hernandez got 10. OK, they had this other charlatan, uh, David Wilcox, uh, uh, who, who got a thousand five hundred people and packed that auditorium. And Ray Hernandez got 10 people because they have you competing against each other. OK, when they had me sitting down at a table, they had me sitting down next to uh, the alien hunter. OK, this guy that had these uh, hands, these clay hands that were hardened over time, uh, 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 these huge hands with these um, um, uh, rods, these thin rods like nails popping out. So he had all of that on his table. He had like like 20 people lining up to buy his book and to get his signature. But yet Ray Hernandez, with all these academics and this five-year academic research study, I sold two books while I was there. So Don't, don't take it personally, Ray. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the stage of, you know, ufology yeah. and that's why most of the uh, the NDEA experiencers uh, the psi researchers people like Dean Radin uh, Jeffrey Long Raymond Moody uh, Kenneth Ring all these people that are now working with us uh, while we were doing the UFO stuff they want nothing to do with us okay <laughs> because um, which is perfectly understandable but now that we're focusing now on the bigger picture of consciousness and contact with non-human intelligence and the whole aspect of ufos is one small component of it then they're able to to join in <laughs> because um uh, now we're talking about you know the psi phenomenon near-death experiences out-of-body experiences remote viewing things that are more um uh, established uh within their realm but yet to the normal population, all of these topics are taboo topics. But uh, it's just going to be taking uh, several generations, I think, um, to, to be able to be receptive to these topics because we're dealing with consciousness. We're dealing with topics that are, uh, you know, the opposite of materialism, you know. And, and at this point, um, it's not that they're taboo topics. It's that they're not even understood, yeah. you know, by the normal person when you talk to them. Well, I think it was Max Planck, the physicist, who said that science progresses through a series of funerals. 
Um, exactly. But, it, that's the structure of scientific revolution. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're waiting now for these old buzzards to die. <laughs> but what it is is that three fourths of the buzzards that are in our new organization, they're all above seventy as well. <laughs> so, yeah. But I don't think. That, but those buzzards have already converted to a, a deeper understanding. But I don't think we have several generations to wait. I mean, I think that the situation is more of an emergency, and perhaps that's why there is some kind of global awakening taking place. And that's perhaps why these beings are kind of whoever they are, are intervening more and more. And, um, you know, you've talked about that, that a lot of them, one of their main emphases seems to be the ecological disaster. And, you know, the possibility that we're going to kill ourselves that way. Um, so I guess you, you, you could probably spin off a comment just on that. But I guess maybe I'll end it with a short question, which is, um, do you, have, have, has it given you optimism, uh, all that you've learned, that th through whatever means, including the types of um, visitations or and experiences that your, um, your research subjects have had, that we are going to turn it around? That, 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 you know, through our own efforts or through the intercession of these other forms of intelligence that humanity's kind of going to make it and that they will wait that enough people will be sort of woken up to the reality and the need and the urgency of the situation in, um, in time to turn things about okay let me address that question as follows if i were just to look at the state of our current rea reality you know given our politics, our economics, um, or the continuing dis destruction of our resources and our environment and how we f pray and feed upon each other fellow human being, given the economic structures that we have, et cetera, et cetera. If I were just to look at that, I would be totally pessimistic. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Totally pessimistic. But Which is probably thing, why half the country is addicted to opioids, because that's all they see on the news, and that's what they think the reality is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but here's a contrast to that, okay? The flip to that. Um, my personal experiences have been that these experiences have been orchestrated, and we haven't had enough time in our discussions to talk about the specifics, but things were put right in front of me. OK, um, and not only myself, but many, many other people. Now, go back. When did remote viewing become popular? Do you recall uh, or when, when people found out about remote viewing? I, I started hearing about, uh, I don't know, in the 90s with Courtney Brown and the, that comet that was coming and, and that whole business. And then that that Heaven's Gate cult committed suicide and it, <laughs> it got tarnished by that event. That, that was my first awareness of it. OK, it. it first became popularized in the early 70s at uh, Stanford University, at the Stanford Research Institute. And then the military bought in, then the CIA bought in, and and then it's it's continued and under the table. the Russians were working on it and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was really the, the early 70s. Now, when did this, this whole aspect of um, NDEs become popularized? Um, well, I don't know again. Well, well, let, well let me tell you. You I'm, tell I'm, me. Uh, I mean, I've read yeah, a lot yeah. of those Let, books. With, you know. with Raymond Moody's book, Life right. After Life, sure, 19, yeah. 1975. Okay. Okay, within three years of the remote viewing. Um, the out of body experience was popularized by Ma Robert Monroe. Okay? Before that, people didn't know about it in the general population. Okay? People talked about it in the you know, different mystical texts and and genres, but it was popularized with Robert Monroe's uh, first book. When did he first uh, um, popularize? I forgot the exact title of the book, but it was, I think it was 1973 or 74 as well. Again, within a couple of years of each other, okay? The, the whole UFO genre, when did that become really widely discussed, okay? Star Trek, when did Star Trek come on board. Well, that was popular in the 60s, but of course, there's a big UFO upsurge in the early 50s, you know, correct, correct. But it wasn't, and all that. But it wasn't popularized right, all right. over the world. It was just little small clicks that got into the UFO stuff. <clears throat> but once Star Trek came on, all of a sudden, millions of people all around the world, okay? And then eventually ancient aliens and all of this stuff. But again, we're talking about the same time period. So early, right? in, early to mid-70s, it really started to... Now, this, now, this is before the internet, so you can't blame it on the internet. Oh, it's because of the internet, the internet. No, 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 no. All these four experiences became popularized at this, pretty much the same time. Why? Is that a coincidence? I, I would think they're interrelated. There's a shift in consciousness taking place. Correct. That's what's taking place. It's a shift in consciousness that's taking place to talk about the different contact modalities. And 
whatever this intelligence that we're dealing with, you know, um, they are able, manip- able to manipulate space time. Okay. Uh, to them, they know what's going to happen in the future. They know what's happened in the past. Okay. They're able to somehow come into this reality and in- interject. Okay. Our data shows that. Okay. From, we haven't gotten into those aspects of it in our research study. <clears throat> But 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 again, many of the people that talk about OBEs, NDEs, uh, remote viewers, you know, we're talking about manipulating space time and getting information from the past and in the future. OK, so w- w- my take to all of this is that um, someone has an eye on us, whatever that someone is, we have no idea. OK, but we're being guided. OK, whether we're going to be ultimately successful uh, in, in changing. Okay, I don't know, but at least I'm hopeful that, yes, they are going to be successful because if if the the way I see them is sort of like of seeing like an angel, how do you visualize uh, an entity with angelic powers? Okay, Uh, that's the type of powers, quote unquote, that that we're dealing with. Okay, so if if they want something to occur, they, quote unquote, they, I think it's going to happen. So I think humanity will turn the curve. uh, if not, they might just say, the hell with it, you know, these people are hopeless, you know, let's start all over again and have a total depopulation of humanity. And that is a, another very common theme among experiencers. Uh, people have gotten either lucid dreams or direct experiences. My wife, um, let me just give you an experience with my wife. All of a sudden, um, she came down to me and she says, you need to become more spiritual. This is before I had my spiritual experiences, okay? Uh, because uh, humanity uh, uh, population, most of it is going to be wiped out. We're going to be living like Native Americans. We're not going to need medical doctors to rip us off. Uh, we're going to be doing our own home cures. We're going to be living in communes, treating each other in a communal way, loving each other. And she just went on and on and on and on. Now, if you know my wife, she's like one of these Mexican traditional housewives. She doesn't even have a computer. She doesn't go to the internet. She doesn't read any books on anything close to this stuff. New age, forget it, you know? That's sacrilegious, you know? So I asked, I was like totally shocked and it came out sort of like a robotic voice from my wife, right? And I was like totally freaking out. What the hell is this? What the hell's going on? I said, you know, where did you read that? I didn't read it. Where did you learn it from? You know, did someone tell you this? No, no one ever told me this. Well, how do you know about it? I just know it, you know? And, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, after she finishes, um, she says, we need to be ready for this, you know, for this transition, you know. And then she went upstairs, and then I followed her like a couple of minutes later because I was like, you know, I need to get more information. What the hell happened here, right? She was dead asleep. The next day, she didn't remember what took place, okay? What I just told you is one, uh, also a major uh, component of what these experiencers have received, Okay, that we're about to uh, possibly, if we don't change, have a purging of humanity. That's an, another very common trend. So what I think is going to be taking place, my speculation is that, look, if we don't get our act together, there will be a purging of humanity so that we could restart again. Yeah, it's interesting. Um and, and spiritual, I mean, it deals with spirituality, you know, it does. That we, need to get, we need to get our mind uh, intact with who we really are. I think that's the key to it. That, that thing your wife yep. said, you need to become more spiritual. I mean, yep. you, you, you can stock canned goods in the, in the basement or something, but, <laughs> but the, the, the thing that's really going to save you one way or the other, um, even if your body doesn't survive, I would say the, th- the key component is to awaken the spiritual zeal and, and really accomplish yep. as much spiritual evolution as possible. Yep. You know that we don't kill any animals. Lizards out in the yard? No. You know how many uh, toads I've thrown away in the last two weeks? Like eight toads, and there's still one last night that's out there. I have to drive like a mile and a half away from my house where this nice little canal, okay, uh-huh. and throw the toads out there. That's sweet. Because we can't even kill a little lizard, okay? Yeah. Ants. We don't kill ants, okay? My wife hugs trees. She communicates to plants and trees, okay? This is what these experiences do to you. Yeah, okay, yeah. totally transformed to you. I talked to God before I was a total atheist. Okay, so it's 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 um, um, we need to evolve, we need to transcend, we need to become more spiritual. Uh, and what's taking place is an awakening of humanity, but it's too damn slow, and they're too selective to who they're doing this to. They need to do it to the rest of the world, not just to a few individuals at a time. Yeah, well, you know, there's the 
there's various um, examples in physics. Uh, there's one in particular that is called, um, well, the way a laser works, for instance. Light yep. amplification by stimulated emission of radiation is what laser stands for. And the way it works is you get the square root of 1% of the photons to align coherently with one another in the laser, and then all the rest of the photons in train with them, and the whole thing becomes one coherent you know, beam of light. And in the heart, um, 1% of the cells are called pacemaker cells, and they regulate the, the beating of all the other cells in the heart. And there are many uh, other, other examples like that in nature where a certain percentage um, uh, is, when reached, will have a kind of a regulating or coordinating or co coherence-creating effect in the rest of the population of that particular thing heart cells or light or photons or whatever. So it may not be that the aliens or whoever they are, again, I shouldn't just say aliens, it may not be that these non-human intelligences need to sort of inter interact with every single person in the world, but a certain percentage of them could result in a tipping point at which the entire humanity will be profoundly influenced. Yeah, that, that's sort of the theory that's out there. A lot of people are talking about. Um, if I could sort of introduce, um, if people need to communicate with me. Um, it's uh, info at experiencer.org. That's, your, that's at your personal email address? The, the personal email address. And then this new organization um, uh, uh, is titled Consciousness and Contact Research Institute. We're developing a website as we speak, and the members of our organization are Dr. Rudy Shields, who I mentioned before, the professor of astrophysics at, at, at Harvard. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Long, who is um, a medical oncologist. Um, he's going to be joining us as the co-chair of our, our research committee. Um, uh, one of the world's leading experts on near-death experiences, Dr. Gary Schwartz, who's a professor of psychology, was a tenured professor at Yale University, and um, uh, he's been studying mediumship for the last 20 years at the University of Arizona. Uh, Dr. John Klimo, who I talked about before, 45-year um, professor of psychology. Uh, Dr. Claude Swanson, the PhD physicist from Princeton. Dr. Bob Davis, the PhD uh, professor of neuroscience. Dr. Michael Grosso, who uh, has a PhD in philosophy from Columbia University, and he's affiliated with the University of Virginia, the Division of Perceptual Studies. Uh, the Ian Stevenson organization that dealt with um, uh, our reincarnation and Dr. Bruce Grayson with near-death experiences, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mishloff, who has a PhD in parapsychology from Berkeley, um, Dr. John Alexander, uh, who uh, did his PhD in near-death experiences and was the head of the Remote Viewers Association for many, many, many years, uh, Dr. Sean um, uh, Ez. Jorn Hargens, a professor of philosophy of integral research at the Kennedy School, um, Dr. Glenn Ryan, PhD biochemist, uh, who uh, also is interested in consciousness, Dr. Paul Bernstein, PhD from uh, Stanford, a uh, uh, psychologist. Uh, so, uh, a pretty are, respectable uh, crew. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, so, um, and then we're we're having other advisors and consultants, and Dean Radin is just one of them. And again, what we're trying to do is how do we conduct the world's first academic research study to understand the relationship between consciousness, our cosmology, and contact with non-human intelligence via the contact modalities. And um, uh, I envision something very similar to what we did with the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, which is like a five-year comprehensive academic research study with surveys, questionnaires, um, uh, accumulating data, and doing in-depth interviews of the major cases, um, and then putting out books and publications, peer-reviewed publications. So if people and, are listening uh, to this and they think they might be a candidate for your next study, should they email you at that address? Yes, at info at experiencer.org. And then for the old organization, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, we have um, the free copy of chapter one of our book. Our book is titled uh, Beyond UFOs, The Science of Consciousness and Contact with Non-Human Intelligence. And uh, you can read chapter one for free. And the one I sent you that you read, that's 120 pages, a lot of data, tons of data in that chapter, and it's for free. You can download it. And our website, you go to our website uh, of the old free organization. The website is consciousnessandcontact.org. I'll be linking to that on your page there. Yeah, yeah, uh, consciousness in, in and contact. 
Yeah. Yeah. Consciousnessandcontact.org. Good. So we've got, and we've got numerous academic articles on consciousness and contact uh, at our website. So you can begin reading what these academics are saying about the topic of consciousness and contact, including Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Dr. Rudy Shield, uh, Dr. Dean Radin, um, and many other individuals. It's, a, it's funny in a way that you mentioned that Dean, I think you said Dean was one of them, and, and some of the other parapsychology researchers were skittish about any kind of involvement in anything to do with extraterrestrials, even though their field is extremely uh, ooga booga in a way, you know, by, yes, yes, by, yes. by normal standards. But it seems to me that if we really want to be scientific about it, and I appreciate the fact that you've used the word hypothesis many times in this conversation, we're not talking about beliefs here, we're talking about things that are potentially investigatable, you know, Correct. that, that we, we might consider as possible, but we don't know until we investigate them. But it's interesting that they shun any sort of notion of, or, or in, any interest in actually, um, you know, beings from some other place, some other planet, because it seems to me that even though that might be only part of the picture of what's going on, it is a part, you know, yeah. and, and, and if we really want to know the whole picture, we should just throw that in the <laughs> basket along with everything else and consider, you know, all possibilities. Uh, and, for, but, but, you know, you've been yeah. a little bit um, dismissive of MUFON and, um, because of their nuts and bolts, superficial, materialistic approach. But at least they've contributed something, which is a, a fair amount of um, data and evidence that uh, nuts and bolts craft have been flying around, uh, apparently, that we don't totally understand. So, I don't know. My attitude is always... You know, let's understand everything we can understand and not exclude anything because it makes us uncomfortable. Okay, regarding MUFON, um, you know, my personal perspective is that, you know, what have we learned in 75 years? That their UFOs exist, that they're out there, people are seeing them. Uh, some people have taken pictures of it. You know, they're able to um, appear in one place and instantaneously a second later be 40 miles away on radar you know these types of things yeah that's um, interesting how they do that yeah that's and, very interesting but that's been going on for 75 years right and what more but, are we learning about that nothing well, much. what are more are we learning about that right. exactly so in five years of our academic research study on the experiencer what have we learned tons of stuff tons of stuff okay because we took a different approach Okay, because we focused on the experiencer. Now, in terms of Dr. Dean Radin, let me just give you a little insight. Um, um, I don't know whether I should tell you this or not, but I'll, but I'll say what the hell, you know. Um, basically, Dean was always interested in what we're doing. He was very receptive to what we're doing because he clearly hypothesized that this experience was much more than just nuts and bolts. Okay, it was way, way more complicated because he was a very close friend of Jacques Vallée. Uh, they've interacted for many, many, many year, years, and um, and uh, uh, and many other individuals that have, uh, were interested in this field that were not nuts and bolts types. Okay, so he clearly was interested. However, as an organization, he's part of a, of an organization, the Institute for Noetic Science, and they have their mission and their focus. And they yeah. have their mission, and their missions is to stay away from ufology, um, and. Um, and you'll be talking to the director of that organization in, 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 in a few months. Uh, uh, but um, uh, we, 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 could, we could talk about things off the record uh, re regarding <laughs> that. But, but basically, the, they would not be too receptive to exploring the topic of, uh, of UFOs because their funding stream would be significantly um, impacted, declined yeah. if they moved that direction. They, they would prefer to deal with, you know, mystical meditation, mm -hmm. the psi phenomenon, yoga classes, you know, things of that sort. You know, yeah. that's more in line with their mission. Well, fortunately, my funding stream doesn't care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it's fine that we all have our different areas of focus not every, we, we shouldn't all be trying to do the same thing and we can't all do everything so it's it's good MUFON does its thing you're doing your thing and and ions does its thing and you know uh, but, but but dean Raiden is involved with us right right he will be part of this team yeah i know that yeah um here's a question that came in from um saguna Mueller in austria she asks um although reality is beyond time form and manifestation there has always been a unifying comprehension throughout all spiritual traditions that are pointing to the essence of truth, which is always the same if you ignore conceptualization. I wonder, 
are there ancient sacred texts or traditions that are describing and predicting that during critical times on Earth, that UFOs, et cetera, will play a tangible role for humanity? And my answer to that question is yes, but you go, what would you say to that? Well, I would say that all of the ancient mystical traditions, uh, all the ancient and indi- uh, all the indigenous cultures all around the world, um, um, they're, they're more in tune to a true nature of our reality than the vast majority of quote unquote civilized humanity. Okay. And that the ancient mystical texts um, repeatedly discuss all of this. Okay. In terms of we're all one, you know, unity in terms of consciousness, you know, there's, there's no separation, you know, that we're living in Maya, you know, that our reality is Maya, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the people that understand that literature, that I've read that literature, uh, know that, understand that. Now, um, you could read into, I'm not a, by any way near a scholar of these ancient mystical texts, even though um, there are many people that I associate with that are. Um, and they have told me, uh, not, not from my personal readings, that there's a lot of writings in there about, you know, humanity needs to change, needs to evolve, become more spiritual, about, um, I don't want to use the word end times, but you know, that, that humanity might not be here very long if we don't change. So, yes, those types of phrases and concepts are interweaved in there. Uh, just like uh, if you read the Bible, you could get almost anything in the Bible, you know. Um, um, and, but, but, yes, I, I would agree with that, with that statement 100%. Yeah, there was a book uh, that I read back in the early 80s by a woman named Moira Timms called Prophecies and Predictions, Everyone's Guide to the Coming Changes. And what she did was she took all the ancient traditions and, and noted what they said about what was supposed to happen in the future. And then she correlated with that, that with all the stuff that has actually happened since those traditions said that stuff. And then she, and that kind of brought us up to the present time. And then she sort of looked at what they had said that hasn't happened yet. And it all was basically that, yeah, we're in for some heavy times and that if we make it through those times, there's going to be a much better world, you know, on the other side of it, but that we better buckle our seatbelts because it could get pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, um, that, that's, that's a consistent theme um, that in the, uh, experiencers have been told by non-human intelligence and that among experiencers, you know, they, they understand that. And so they're getting this message and they're getting also a message that things are going to change soon, not, you know, 100, 200 years down the road that whatever these changes are going to take place, it's going to happen soon. So uh, among themselves, they discuss this over and over again. And I get that question asked repeatedly. What have others people said in terms of when it's going to happen? Because I just know it's going to happen soon. I just know it's going to happen soon. And, and again, you cannot give these people definitive answers to these things. But it's something that literally a large percent of these experiencers are talking about. Yeah, we're feeling it in our bones. Yeah. Um, I also just want to add to Saguna's question that um, I've done a lot, quite a bit of Vedic reading and study, and there's a number of books in which they <clears throat> itemize a whole long list of different kinds of beings that exist in various realms. They have all sorts of names for them, you know, Apsarasas and Kanaras and Gandharvas and all kinds of different no- things. And they also... Um, you know, talk about various other planets and the life that lives on those planets and the possibility of yogis communicating with those planets and so on and so forth. So that's just one example of an ancient tradition that was conversant with that stuff. Um, And I don't think it was merely fanciful, you know, imaginary uh, writing. I I I think that they, it was probably written by people who had some sort of experience to, you know, be able to say the things they were saying. And that's just one tradition I happen to have studied a fair amount. But I think that other traditions have, I'm sure if you look at what the Aborigines have to say and various other ancient traditions, you'll, you'll see similar things. Yes, no, no, I, I 100% in agreement. Uh, if, if, uh, if I were to become a scholar in ancient mystical texts, <laughs> you, you could literally write, you know, a Funk and Wagnall's encyclopedia, or the world book, you know, the, the one I had when I was a little kid, you know, uh, filled with 36 volumes of commonalities. So throughout all of ancient um, society, they knew all these things. They understood these things because they were having experiences. It was either past word of mouth much of this, or in their written um, um, uh, written documents, um, uh, either 
either direct experiences or through out-of-body experiences or visitations, whatever. Um, but these things are repeatedly told, you know, culture by culture by culture by culture. So, um, um, uh, again, you know, we have more questions than we have answers. Uh, at this point, uh, anyone that, you know, that you have on your show that comes across, you know, with any definitive statements, definitive arguments, you know, these, these people are totally clueless. You know, you ought to turn, unplug the show right then and there because <laughs> they're totally clueless. We don't even know what questions to ask uh, about these topics. Yeah. Uh, generally, I haven't covered this topic too much on this show, although I have, you know, interviewed a bunch of OBE and NDE people, but usually people have a pretty humble uh, approach to it you know the uh, the experience humbles you you know and oh yeah oh, and definitely, definitely, they they definitely. tend to be very heart centered and very open minded and yes. you know kind of sincere and innocent and exploratory in their attitude um so i have a whole bunch of questions here from a fellow in miami which i could ask you but at the same time i want to make sure that you know after we hang up today you're not going to feel like oh darn you know we should have talked about this and that and we didn't get a chance <laughs> to so are there some certain areas that are important to you that you that would be important for people to hear that we haven't touched upon yet yeah let me just uh, summarize a couple of concepts first of all uh, we have various chapters from our book available for free Okay, our book is 820 pages. So we're, we, we have already like about 300 pages for people to take a look at. Up okay? on the website there. Up on the website. You go to consciousnessandcontact.org and you could download those chapters. We also have many, many articles written by academics and scientists about this topic. Uh, and um, um, and if you want a, a PDF version of it, you know, you could also send and put and be put on our mailing list. To be put on our mailing mailing list, uh, send the mailing list to info at experiencer.org, info at experiencer.org. And also, I want your listeners to understand that um, what what we did in terms of that first book not was not because we are a UFO organization. No, but we wanted to understand one of the spokes of the wheel yeah. of the contact modalities, which we had no, yeah, no data at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so now that we understand that phenomenon a little bit bigger, then we can begin to integrate it with the other contact modalities where we do have a lot of data. So that was the reason for doing that. And again, the focus here is to try to understand the unthinkable, try to understand the mind of God, the universal mind, <laughs> okay? Try to understand consciousness. You know, that's the ultimate goal out of this. But we're doing it through the contact experiencer of the contact modalities, to see the relationship that they have. So that, that really is what we're doing, which is quite uh, unique. No one has ever done that. But yet all of these academics that I mentioned before, they've all discussed these concepts and topics among themselves. And I'm sure you've talked about it um, you know, with you and other individuals as well, you know, in terms of the interrelationships here. But um, so we're going to take our uh, our full body, not our toe, but the full body plunging in into this arena, which no one has ever done before. Okay. W would you like to hear some of these questions? That this yes, fellow? please. Okay. His name is William and he's in Miami. You guys can go out and have lunch together. <laughs> um, okay. He, he but, can um, buy me a, ca a cafe con leche. He better. Um, so since there's quite a few questions here, try to give relatively brief answers to each one, but don't, you know, don't cut them short, but um, let's just go down the list. There's about 10 questions. Um, and if we, you know, if you get tired of it, let me know. But well, I mean, um, do we each one at a time? You think yeah, let's easier? do them one at a time. Okay, right. Um, so his first question is, which aliens are you dealing with? And I know you don't want to just use the term aliens, but you can re reinterpret that question slightly and answer it. Yeah, we're dealing with literally thousands of different perceived types of non-human intelligence. Um, in um, our uh, questionnaire, we had 12 specific types of entities, okay? And then we had a box called Other. Well, other was 36% <laughs> because there were literally hundreds and hundreds of other, okay? But the number one type of uh, entity at 55% was the energy being. Okay? What is that? Explain that. Okay. We, we didn't give any clear definitions of it, but well, this was uh, uh, an intelligence that their form was energy, but it didn't have a human structural form of, um, uh, like, for example, when you have um, uh, um, 
a near death experience you you uh, the the entity that people are de- uh, perceiving as god okay they're describing it as an energy being that's a, a, like a humanoid type of format but you don't see the eyes you don't see legs you don't see arms but uh, but there's like a a, um, a structure there some kind of subtle form yeah let me tell yeah, you an experience yeah. i had one time i was this was 1973 and i was giving a lecture on meditation at a college in elmira new york and there had been a snowstorm and so only two people next to Ithaca yeah right right there was a college there Uh, only two people came to the lecture because there was a snowstorm so there was one person sitting on my right and one person sitting on my left and as I was talking I was kind of talking to this person turning my head and talking to that person going back and forth and all of a sudden I felt like there was a third person in the room and I looked straight ahead of me and there was like a ball of light that seemed very conscious and very aware and it's like I kind of just gave it a nod of recognition, like, hello. And yeah. it, it's sort of like there was this feeling of hello. And, and then I just went on, came, continued to give my lecture. So I guess you might call that an energy being. Yes, yes. The, um, uh, most of the energy beings that people are perceiving are orbs of different types. But in this case, this is an orb that's you know, communicating with you. Okay. Um, and so um, that was number one. Number two is the human looking being at 52%. Okay, so these are anywhere from eight feet tall human looking beings to, you know, smaller, you know, ent- entities that are look like humans, but they're small, but the vast majority, six to seven feet tall. Some of them are put into the Palladian box that are like blonde hair and blue eyes, um, very athletic with um, a skin tight blue suit. You know, uh, very large numbers of those, um, and but the vast majority are in the category of people what they call masters, which are human-looking beings that are dressed in white uh, monks' robes. Some of them come in brown robes. Some of them are uh, tunic, Roman tunics, um, and um, some of them are Asian-looking. Some of them are black-looking, but the vast majority of uh, perceived to be white. Uh, some of them have beards, some of them have no beards. Um, uh, so that's the number two category at 52%, human-looking being. Number three were the, sh- the small grays. These are the typical um, entities that you see on the internet with the big head, the, the big uh, uh, eyes, wraparound eyes, uh, very, very thin with the uh, hands and legs, very, very thin. Um, that was at um, 51%. And then coming in fourth place was the the spirits and ghost types of beings. That was at 47%. So those are the four major types of beings. And I can go down the list, but that sort of um, gives him an idea of, of the four major categories that people are, uh, are interacting with. Okay, good. So his second question is, do you have equality with them? Well, um, not, not only you, but I guess contactees in general. Well, we asked that question, um, and uh, roughly seventy uh, percent of the people that had con- direct con- physical contact stated that uh, they were not abductees; that they were contactees. And out of those, thirty-five percent, no, seventy percent, said that they were equal relationship equality, and thirty-five percent said that it was like no separation; there was no difference. Um, how how they were they were treated, so yes, I would say that maybe seventy percent of the people answered that way in terms of equality. Okay, good. And I think you just answered his third question, which is how are you treated? Uh, are you talked down to or condescended to in conversations? But it sounds like they they are treating people respectfully. Well, again, there's a small group that had frightful experiences. In the beginning, it was 37%. Later on, it went down to, depending on the questions that was asked, between 5 to 15%. Um, now, it wasn't that they were talked down to or anything like that. What it was that for many of the people, their experiences started with a medical inspection. So they were paralyzed. They were on a table. They were having usually these three grays that were physically inspecting them. And, and if that's the only experience you had, you're going to be traumatized for the rest of your life. But, but gratefully, the vast majority of people had continued experiences. And then their experiences continued to other types of experiences, including experiences with the human-looking beings and other types of beings, which are much more spiritually related experiences. Okay. His fourth question is, are you showing everything they do to you? No, the vast majority of, uh, of these memories are only small glimpses. I like don't even you remember just, it all. 
No, no. You just remember like a couple of minutes, a few minutes, and that's it. Um, and and then you go back and you try to piecemeal these experiences together. That's why these people that are on the internet, like Corey Good, that has every week he has eight straight hours of physical contact experiences with a being. You medically know that person's full of shit because he himself no, claims to have that. You mean? Yes, yes, uh. yes. So you know, th- uh, no one in our survey. All the hundreds of people that I've spoken to one-on-one um, talk about it like this way. Uh, it's just uh, you have to understand that they don't want, these, uh, they don't want you to remember, remember, uh, to remember uh, the full details of these experiences. You remember it in glimpses. That's why a lot of these experiences come through hypnotic regressions, which is very problematic to begin with, hypnotic regressions. Because it can um, conjure up any old thing. Yeah, yeah, correct. There's numerous problems with that. Mm-hmm. But, but even then, even in hypnotic regressions, you remember glimpses, you know, small aspects of this. So um, that's my response to that question. Okay. And then the next question is, uh, whenever I use the word you here, you, we can presume it means contactees in general, not just Ray yeah. Hernandez, but do you understand their agenda? Well, as I stated before, uh, uh, if uh, I could only relate what uh, individuals are telling me and what they have been told by this intelligence is that uh, we as humanity needs to change, both in terms of our environment and also in terms of ourselves. We need to uh, to cleanse ourselves of all these, you know, wickedness, the ego, you know, selfishness, materialism. We need to become more spiritual. So, you know, humanity needs to change both in terms of your inner self and your outer self, how we treat other individuals and how we treat our planet. Okay, and I think you've already answered his next question, so I'll skip to the following one, um, which is, are you being used but don't realize it? Hey, let them keep on using me, okay? <laughs> uh, let, let them do this to the rest of humanity yeah. because look how people are changing, okay? Yeah. They're changing to the point where you want your best friend to be that way. Mm. You want your children to be that way. You want your spouse to be that way. Okay, so what I always say, okay, is why don't they do this to the rest of the world? If they did this to the rest of the world, we wouldn't have exploitation, economic exploitation. We wouldn't have destruction of our planet, okay? We'll become much more loving to each other, much more caring. You wouldn't have homelessness. You wouldn't have people without, you know, homes to sleep in, food, people are running around hungry all over the world. You wouldn't have that. It would be a totally different society if whatever this intelligence did to us as individuals are doing it to the rest of humanity. So if we're being manipulated, please keep it coming. (laughs) Maybe they can, excuse me, maybe they can only do it to or with people who are receptive to it or who are at a certain openness or something and you know you can't just sort of force it on someone who is well, that's closed what they down. did to me that's what they did to me yeah but <laughs> you you might have seemed closed down but i bet you you were ripe for this well i was totally closed down to all of this and it took two and a half years of cracking my skull open me, <laughs> me denying it 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 until this one last experience that just was the icing on the cake as i said that little cherry on the top you know yeah. and, and it was at that 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 point I, okay i give up i give up and it was after that last experience that it all stopped mm. And just like cause, cause okay, they, they've done their job. He's ready. Yeah, he's ready. Yeah, we got him. You know. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> you've you've kind of answered this too, but I, I bet you could elaborate on it a little bit. Um, have they imprinted you? You know what he means by that? Well, no, no, no. I but think I he could, means I is the, have they him. implanted some sort of knowledge or agenda or something in your consciousness, which you are now enacting which you oh, of course which you're carrying out it's like they fed of course you downloaded something and of course of and now course. you're working with it of course of yeah, course yeah. All, all major contact experiences would agree with that <laughs> it, it's it's a two-way street here they download information but they also up, they first upload information about you so it's like a two-way street and it continues okay most of this stuff you don't realize it let me just give you an example of this okay just one little illustration. Um, we had finished our research study, so we had all this massive data. Okay, then the next step is: what the hell do you do with all this data? 
Okay. We had just finished. This was within a couple of days. Okay. All of a sudden on a Saturday morning, I woke up. I had the whole book. Do you have that book in front of you? or? Like, uh, uh, I never got the physical one, but I can show the cover oh, on the goodness. screen. I need to mail it to you. I need to mail it to you. I'm showing the but, cover on the screen right now. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, all of a sudden, I had the image of what the cover of the book would look like. Okay. I had all the chapters and all the authors for all the chapters. The only one that I didn't have was who was going to be writing the conclusion for it. Okay. So immediately, I got to my computer and I wrote up like three or four pages of all the details. Okay. So I sent it off to Mary Rodwell and Dr. Rudy Shields, who are surviving co-founders. Edgar had passed away by then. And I said, look, I woke up this morning and this is, you know, the download that I got. I woke up with all this. So all, both of them were like, oh my God, Ray, this is absolutely brilliant. This is great. You know, and so I had written, I said, do I have the green light to move forward, to contact all these people, all these potential authors and co-authors? And they said, yes. So I began to call all these people. All of them said yes. Okay. In our book, all of them said yes. And then the, only, then the last person who's going to be writing our conclusion, it finally came to me like a week later. <clears throat> okay. Um, I stumbled across a book that I had read like three years earlier, written by Brad Steiger. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you know who he is. I, um, I think I might have read a book of his okay. years ago. Brad Steiger um, wrote our conclusion on his deathbed, literally, okay? right before he died. I think he was going into hospice because he told me he's going into a hospital. He might not be returning or he, might, he doesn't know, you know, but um, he kind of knew he was going to pass, right? And he told me, you know, a little bit about it, he and his wife, uh, Sherry. And he wound up writing that book within a couple of weeks of him dying, okay? Now, Brad Steiger, for the folks that don't know him, he's sort of like the godfather of the paranormal. He wrote uh, almost 250 books on all aspects of the paranormal including consciousness, OBEs, NDEs, UFOs, ghosts and spirits, you know, demons, possession, you know, you name it, but for the masses, okay? And so when I sent him that, he says, oh, my God, Ray, it's like, this is like my, my sort of like my life's dream to do what you're doing and to write a conclusion for this, okay? And, um, and, and, and he wound up writing like uh, really a historic chapter, a conclusion, right on his deathbed about how all of this is all interrelated because he knew this like 30 or 40 years ago. He knew all of that, okay? That's why he was focusing on all of these topics, uh, but, um, uh, but we actually are putting it out, you know, as, as a thesis statement, and so that was his chapter that the research needs to continue. This book is very important because for the first time, we got one spoke of the wheel, you know, involved which was never involved in the in the contact modalities and that yes they're all interrelated so um so that answers the question that yes we're being continuously guided you cannot explain these things if you talk to the normal person on the street they'll think you're crazy you know but but yes this is how it works um um major, many major experiencers including nde and ob experiencers will tell you the same thing yeah, I remember hearing that sometimes uh, that Mozart said that sometimes a whole symphony would just come to him in a flash, and then it would just be a matter of writing it all down. But he just had the whole thing in in basically an instant, you know. Oh yeah, no, no. There's so many scientists. As a matter of one Nobel Prize winner in chemistry who just passed away, I forgot his name. Um, he had an actual contact with a non-human intelligence, and a lot of his insights were like that, like. It's all came. Many scientists. Um, what's his name? I, um, um, Edison. All of a sudden, would be like in a dream state. He would take naps in his office, and he would wake up knowing solutions to things that he'd been being his head. Tesla, the same thing. Tesla, in some of his statements, wrote that he had gotten like these downloads from some other types of non-human intelligence. So um, this is all repeated throughout the literature of, of science. But what it is, is totally dismissed. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's all really And cool. also musicians, musicians. Oh, yeah. Like I said, like Mozart and yeah, well, Paul McCartney came up with the, the song every, yesterday in a dream. 
he, he, yeah. he had the whole song and he woke up and he was he didn't know what to call it he started out with scrambled eggs instead of yesterday <laughs> but, yeah. and he ended up writing some lyrics for yeah. it but yeah. a lot of times things yeah. happen that way yeah, uh, many musicians, very, very famous rock musicians, have had encounters with non-human intelligence. And there's a man, his name is Grant Cameron. Oh, yeah, actually I know wrote, We just became wrote Facebook a book. friends. Yeah, he wrote a book about that. Okay? So, again, it's, it's the aspect of downloads from non-human intelligence. It's very, very common, but people just don't talk about it because it's just this woo-woo craziness, you know? Yeah. So, you guys are going to do another book, and this one's going to have be much more focused on the consciousness angle, right? It's going to be a second yes, volume. The, this book is sort of like an introduction to this new academic research um, uh, institute. And what it is, it's going to have a, both a physical hard volume, uh, again, like 800 pages, and it's going to be uh, two Kindle versions of over 500 pages each. Now, the Kindle versions are mainly going to be experiencers talking about their experiences via the contact modalities. So that medical doctor that I told you about, she's going to be talking about her NDE, OBE, coming and seeing ghosts and spirits after she came back from her NDE, seeing Sasquatch, seeing the huge UFO with her husband. And, and, and that's just one of, you know, almost uh, 40 different uh, experiencers that are writing their stories of how all this is interrelated. So people, when they read that, they say, look, this is not just about UFOs. It's about everything, the full big picture. And then the academic articles are going to be sort of laying the introduction to these uh, concepts. Great. Um, and so the title of that book is titled A Greater Reality, The New Paradigm of Consciousness, the Paranormal, and the Contact Modalities. And that should be, should be out available in uh, late spring. So again, get on our mailing list, send me an email to info at experiencer.org, info at experiencer.org. We'll put you on the mailing list. So as soon as uh, that book is uh, released, um, we'll send you a couple of free chapters from that book. <laughs> and, um, and, and if you're interested, you know, buy the book, we'll make it, um, you know, it's going to be three volumes. It's going to be sold as one bu bundle. And the idea is not to make money out of it, but try to sell it, you know, a few bucks above the, the cost price. Yeah. Well, maybe when that new book comes out, we can have another conversation and talk yeah. about a lot of stuff that we didn't get a chance to talk about today. And, and, and that's not even the data from the research study that we're going to be doing. That's going to be five years down the road, at least five years, when we're going to be publishing a whole series of books and academic research articles on what this new data reveals about the, the experiencers of the contact modalities. So the, this book is just to give you a taste, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, 500 page, 800 page taste. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, you're going to be busy for a couple of months uh, yeah. if you purchase those materials. Well, thanks. I think what you're doing is really important. And, um, you know, and I, I just uh, have really enjoyed de delving into it over the past week as I've been preparing for this and having this conversation with you. And um, it's certainly interesting times we live in. And, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to see how things develop over the coming years. And I, I hope you pace yourself a little bit, get some exercise, get some sleep. <laughs> Don't burn yourself out too bad with all this work. And uh, stick around. Uh, enjoy the, the fireworks. No, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. My goodness, it was like two and a half hours totally passed by without even thinking about it. And we could continue for another two and a half hours. I mean, because these are these are fundamental questions of 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 our reality, of our life, of our mission. It's your mission, it's my mission. We're both discussing the same topics. Uh, we're discussing it at different planes, different realms, but it's the same, you know, fundamental question, who we are and how do we interact with the true nature of our reality. Perfect. Good ending. So, thank you, Ray. Um, and I'll be putting up a page on bathgap.com with the links that you've mentioned, with your bio and every, anything else you want me to put there. And, um, Anything new that comes out that you want me to put there, just let me know. Um, and so just to those listening or watching, um, you know, also in addition to checking out that page and the links to Ray's stuff, uh, there's a few things on BatGap that you might want to know about. One is the audio podcast. There's a link for that in case you don't have time to sit and watch videos so much. Um, the other is uh, to be notified by email when a new interview comes out. So there's a mailing list sign up thing. Um, and I would also encourage 
people watching on YouTube to subscribe to the channel because then YouTube notifies you. And there aren't too many more different things on BatGap. It's not a huge amount. It's a big site, but they're, it, the menus themselves are pretty simple. So just like pop the different menus down and you'll see what we have to offer. So thanks for listening or watching. And uh, thank you again, Ray. We'll be in touch again. And uh, we'll see all you listeners and viewers next week.